You're like, uh oh, what are we going to do? Well, first of all, let me welcome you here, okay? And thank you for being here. Thank you for braving the uh, the white stuff that's out there and, and getting here and getting to uh, worship the Lord together. We are going to read some scripture. If you are a first time visitor or if you've never done this before, do me a favor. Go in front of you. You'll see a connection card. Fill that out and put it in the offering plate. I'd like to send you a, uh, a letter just welcoming you here and thanking you for being here, okay? Now, I know you're all wondering what we're going to change things up with, okay? This is what I'm going to do. We're going to read some scripture. We're going to pray and greet each other. And when you greet each other, take your Bibles and your stuff with you and move up and scrunch together, okay? We're just going to just have a good old intimate worship time together um, and uh, get to, to worship God. And that's your reward for getting here right now. That's what we really want to do. We want to just praise the Lord together and uh, be family, okay? But let me read something out of scripture. It says in Romans uh, 28, we know that God, uh, 828, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom we foreknew. He also, pre was, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Ladies and gentlemen, we are to be more and more like Jesus. Your time together to worship is a time for us to, to know him more and to worship him more and to be more and more like him. So, if you are here and you are saying, the old hymn goes, I shall not be, I shall not be, I shall not be moved, change your mind. Let's get together and let's be intimate. Amen? Let me pray with you. Father, stand up. We thank you. And uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 66. <clears throat> We're going to be reading from verses 12 uh, through 15. And it says, For thus says the Lord, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you will be nursed, you will be carried on the hip and fondled on the knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. And you will be comforted in Jerusalem. Then you will see this, and your heart will be glad, and your bones will flourish like the new grass. And the hand of the Lord will be made known to his servants, but he will be indignant towards his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come in fire in his chariots like the whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. If you would please pray with me. Chapter Isaiah, Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. And uh, we're going to spend the rest of our time here uh, looking at God's Word in this chapter. This is the last message of the series on Isaiah going back to August of 2013, on and off. We took a little bit of time off at, at some points, but uh, for the most part, it has been um, a, a continued journey through Isaiah. I hope it uh, helped you. It certainly helped me to grow, and, and we want to continue to challenge ourselves including the preacher getting challenged once in a while. And this was uh, certainly a challenge, and I don't feel that I did enough justice to it. I could have probably spent years on Isaiah more than what we did, but I think I would warn everybody out doing that. Um, let's, um, let's begin by looking at God's Word as you look in Isaiah 66. Um, originally, when I was picking out what to read, uh, knowing that uh, Emily was um, going to read it and being aware of a... Um, of a teenage girl reading that, I did not want her to read um, verses maybe 10 or 11, but uh, reading 12 and beyond I think would probably be a little more appropriate. Of course, the snow um, uh, caused her not to be here. But I want to start with looking at what God says in verse uh, 1 and 2 and beyond. So let me read verses 1 and 2, and I want you to just follow along for a minute, and then I want to tell you a little story. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house that you could build for me? 
Where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things, and thus all these things came into being, declared the Lord. But to this one I will look. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. This is a passage. This chapter really sets the tone for what Isaiah is all about. What is the lesson Isaiah and God has given to Isaiah to tell the world, to tell the people of Israel, and to tell the world? And that is exactly what we see in that last part of verse 2, that this is the one that he will look at. Look at what it says. To him who is humble, contrite of spirit, and who trembles, who trembles at his word. Let me pray with you for a minute. Father, I want to pray and ask, Lord, that you speak to our hearts. Speak to our souls, the very depths of our souls, as we look and see what, God, you are telling us that we must do in response to your word. And Lord, though I may be preaching to the choir in a sense, let us begin to take this the message and take it beyond our own understanding and let it uh, just, God, just extend out to the world as we share it with others. Be with us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm holding up in my hand a certain device that um, a lot of people don't wear these days, but if you wear one of these, do me a favor, raise your hand. If you wear, look at that, okay? Now, if you are under the age of 30 and you wear one of these, go ahead and lift, lift up your hand. Two, three. Medical, right? Right? Jamie, this is Jamie's watch, okay? And Jamie loves this. This is a great watch, Jamie. And Jamie, I asked him as, after he finished reading it, I said, Jamie, could I use your watch? And he didn't even blink twice. He gave it to me. Didn't know if I had a hammer or something and smashed that thing. Didn't even think about anything like that. Of course, I wouldn't do that to, to my son. But I do want to tell a story about a watch. And it's ironic that I get this for my son. I also wear a watch, by the way. And, and um, here, Jamie, here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, didn't pass that to him, brother. Thanks. Okay. All right. So my, my father, when I was about seven years old, just a, a, a little guy, and I was still, we lived in upstate New York, and um, when I was eight, we moved to Florida. But um, when I was seven, uh, my father, before school one day, um, gave me a watch. And he said, he said, here's a watch. Here, here you are. And I was so thrilled. I was like, wow, I get it. You know, I never had a watch before. You know, yeah, and it's walking and it's ticking and all these. There's a Timex watch. You would have thought he gave me a Rolex or something. Right? It was really a nice watch because it was my watch. And I had an older brother. And you know, older brothers, what happens sometimes, right? Um, I, I had a, I had an older brother, and my older brother, um, he didn't see with his eyes. He saw with his hands. You all know what I mean by that? So, so uh, you know, I, I, I had the watch, and, and immediately my brother goes to me and says, uh, he says, get out, get out, watch. And he, he starts to, to look in, and I, I take the watch out of his hand, I go, ah, In front of my dad. He grabbed the watch out of his hand. My dad's face and countenance immediately changed but from being happy to the, the fact that I had, was so thrilled about the watch, to really getting disappointed, and I'll never forget the look on his face, and he grabbed the watch then out of my hands and gave it to my brother and says, there, it's yours now. Man, I could cry with the best of them. I was bawling my eyes out. I was mad. I was crying. I was stomping my feet. Now, this is all before school started. I must have been a real joy that day, right? And, and I'll tell you more about the story. And so my dad took us to school, and it was about a mile and a half, maybe two miles away from the house. And he took us down the street and uh, down these big streets, uh, uh, on ramps, interstates, all this stuff. And it got us to Thomas Jefferson Elementary School, which I went to. And, and uh, my brother went in the front door entrance to the school. And I, because my, my classroom was around the back, normally I would walk around the school, around to the back of the, the, the school, and come in that way and go into my classroom. That's what I was supposed to do. And I was still sobbing and crying and mad and upset. Uh, parents, you, can you all relate to that when you have a kid that just won't get uh, calmed down or anything? I know. I've, I've seen that, right? And, uh, and so uh, I, I get to the little tiny sidewalk heading to the back entrance of the school, and I am so mad, I say to myself, I remember this, I said to myself, I said, well, I'm going to show him I'm not going to go to school. 
So I decided at that moment that I would turn around and walk the other way. Now, this is a seven year old bit of girl when they don't want to go to school. Well, I didn't mind what I peed by I thought, I'm just going to go home. So I just turn around, I walk down the sidewalk, I go down around to the front, nobody saw me, and I walk down the street, and I walk down another street, and I walk down a major street in Utica, New York, and I'm going down the street, and I cross a couple of iron ramps going to the interstate. I'm seven years old, I have no idea what I'm doing. I finally make it to the street that's ready to turn to my street at, at um, in, in, in Utica, and um, and all of a sudden, I see a car drive by slowly, and a very familiar face behind it. And it was a neighbor. And she slows down, and she looks at me, and she says to me a question that everybody in here would ask. A seven-year-old child is walking in the middle of the day, and Lord knows how long it took for me to get there. She said, what are what are you doing here? And what are you doing school? Now, my little brain didn't think of anything except, you know, you don't have to teach a seven-year-old how to lie. And I immediately said, I got sick. I see a great salad, easy to hold on to story, and she led me in her car, she took me to my house, and I go home, and my mother was there now. You gotta understand, my, my mom, you know, she, she, she immediately looks at me, and she's like, what <laughs> She didn't scream her like, like me. What are you doing here? And she's screaming, and, and she, she, she says, what are you doing here? I said, I'm sick. And then I took it a step forward. I said, and I threw up. And, and I had all this great stuff. I started crafting. I guess I crafted it in a car. And then she called the school and said, what are you doing? Look at that. I said, man, we, we never saw him. He never showed up. And, and so she is she is like, what is, what's going on? So, so I thought I had this plan that was so good. And, and I, I had, I had lied my way through it and lied in over time and lied in Finally, she gives the phone to me, and on the other end of the phone is, guess who? My dad. And he said to me, are you sick? And I said, yeah. <laughs> You're not sick. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> it's about the watch, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't know that. He knew it was about the watch, and he said, "You're not getting that watch. Clean up your face, wash your face, and go back to school." And guess what I did? I washed my face, and I went back to school. And when I walked into my classroom, my teacher must have been in on it. She called me Frank. She never couldn't realize that I was Frank. She called me Frank, and she said to me, "Frank, good to see you." And everything was okay after that. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a spoiled brat. There was a kid who was so self-centered and so self-focused, he didn't think about the consequences of his efforts. It was a child that cared about nothing except to get his own way. And my lesson I learned is, you can't always get what you want. Amen? Ladies and gentlemen, the American church today is in so many ways like a child who is crying and whining and wanting to get his own way. We're often spoiled and we have more and more tools than our brothers and sisters in other countries and across the world, and yet we're less and less effective. We have more affluence or less influence. We are more strategic or less evangelistic. We are probably more culturally relevant, but we're far more or less, or far less reaching. And why is that? I think it's because we're a reflection of the American culture, where it's all about the self. We have iPhones and iTunes, and it's all about you. You can have it your own way. You can do your own thing, and you can have that rugged, independent American spirit, but that has nothing to do with Christianity. We've become much too self-reliant. We hold on to our little G-gods of ourselves. We love to market and glorify what we do, but in the process, we leave the glory of God out of everything that we do. In fact, church, oftentimes, 
we resemble corporate America more than what the bride of Christ we are to be. We played, we've made pastors to be CEOs, thankfully not here, and we parade their names around as a brand instead of a shepherd, and again, thankfully not here. We make our own strategic plans. We have our own vision statements. We evaluate ministry based on our return on our investment, and we expect God to bless it. We build wise buildings to make us more comfortable while we ignore a desperate plea of those who need Jesus. We see churches now on TV. They're in basketball stadiums where teams used to play, NBA teams used to play. TV preachers who spew nothing but dribble, and at times they even speak heresy, and we think that's okay. You know what the sad thing about this is? People inside the church and outside the church think that that kind of church is okay. There are examples to follow, and there are things we should emulate. And our measuring rods for success are noses, people in the pews, and numbers, how much we see giving. We see fame and fortune, how, many, how much is our name known out there, and we consider that successful. Let me just tell you the true measure of spiritual growth. Biblical fidelity, biblical truth, uncorrupted love, church health. That should be the measuring rod for every church in America, and that should be our measuring rod today. It's no surprise, then, that the people who are the most vocal critics, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, okay, but the most vocal critics in a church are the ones who are least in God's Word. We have children, and I'm sorry to call them children, they're teenagers, they're 17, 16, 14 years old, Carmelo's getting baptized next week, right, who walk through the snow. I'm not meaning both ways, okay? But I'm here to promise me, I'm not here to come to church. We've got children who are doing that. So we, we, we must say that's the kind of spirit we as adults should emulate and say this is what we should be doing. We have more Bible literacy than ever before. More, more people have Bibles, yet they read a lesson less. And a church becomes a place to go instead of who we are being. Church, this should never be so here. We should not fall into this trap of thinking like the world thinks. I refuse to fall into the shallow, fleshly thinking, and I encourage you not to do the same either. We need to go beyond what we see and beyond the natural and start thinking supernatural about God's work. We need to think with a different scorecard. What he says here in chapter 66, verse number 1, well, this one I look to him who is humble and can try to spirit and who trembles in my word. The word says it's born. God says that's one of mine. That's what we should be. Not noses and numbers, not the physical, but the spiritual. Those who are intimate and spiritual in Christ. Now, I'm encouraged by how God's working. Since we have really turned our focus on God and how He's at work, we're seeing great stuff happening with experience of God. We're seeing baptisms. We have four people waiting for baptisms now. Praise God! We've got more people that want to grow in Christ. Now, do we, do we have a lot of people today? No! You're going to have winter time, you're going to have snow, you're going to have that stuff happen, right? But here's the thing. When you come, and you grow, and you serve, and you share, then we can say that's the measure of what God wants in us. And you individually need to compare yourself not to the preacher, not to the deacon, not to your Sunday school teacher, but to Jesus himself. Because we are conformed, as I read this morning earlier, to be, to be con- we are called to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so when we pray, we should pray. Pray that God will do a work in us individually. When we have intimacy with God, it should be every morning that we spend time with Him. God has gotten me up every morning at 5 a.m. It's crazy. He said, you say, oh, you're just getting old. <laughs> Maybe. How many of y'all get up early, early in the morning? Some of y'all do that, right? And, uh, my mom gets up early in the morning. Maybe I'm getting more like my mom. I don't know. But God has gotten me up early, early in the morning, and I'm just running to Him in prayer. Now, I'm going to confess to you, He got me up at 5 a.m. this morning. I was like, God, I need another hour to sleep. Okay? I'm getting ready to preach. And, and so, you know, that's okay. But, yeah, you know, most days, God has been getting me up, and I get up, and I read, and I spend time praying with Him, and I, I have that intimacy with God. Why? So that I can be more and more like Christ, so God can infill me so that I can go out and do His will. 
I take no credit for it. It's all for the glory of God, and I pray that you do the same. And this is what we have been looking at the past few weeks, the past eight weeks, as we've gone through Isaiah, a new day. The sermon series has been called, the message series has been called, A New Day. Today, it is a new day for you. It's a new day to serve Christ, a new way to think, a new way to take on your life in Christ. Because this is the last chapter and the last message on the book of Isaiah, I want to take a minute to answer what God is saying, because God says this very clearly in chapter 66. starts with, Thus says the Lord, or if I'm going to quote the King James, it seems to be more emphasis. That's what? Say the Lord. Amen? And what he's saying is, pay attention to me when he says that. Here's some key words I want you to remember. You're going to fill in the blanks, and you're going to fill in some key words to keep in mind as you live for him, as you live a life for him. So watch. Escape the child that's crying out inside of you. Resist the temptation to be self-focused. As we said in our Sunday school lesson today, don't worry about that lower man-centered story. Let's look at the upper things of God, the, the, the higher, the upper story, the story that God gives us, the principles that God gives us. Three key words he gives us. The first one is humility. Humility. He gives us a statement followed by two questions. Thus says the Lord. Look what he says. Thus says the Lord. Heaven is my friend. Stay with me. And the earth is my. And then he asks the question Where then is the house you can build for me? Where is a place that I may rest? God is saying here there is no place that can confine him. He is bigger than the temple. He is bigger than our hearts. He's bigger than one place. Unfortunately, church thinking has gotten into temple thinking. You know, we, 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 the temple thinking is this if you just build it, well, what's, the, what's the other part of it? It'll come. If you just build it, they'll come. If you just build a tower, they'll come. Well, I love this thing. You know, this took a lot of effort. And this is for our passion play. But if you just build it, they'll come, right? So we build bigger and bigger and bigger buildings, and we expect them to come. But that doesn't really work, and that's really not what Jesus told us to do. Jesus didn't say, just build a builder, bigger building, and then people will come to it. What did Jesus say? Go ye therefore into all the nations of earth, right? Making disciples of all men. Go out there, get out of your, your house, get out of the streets, get out of here, and go to the people that we normally look at on Sunday mornings. Get out and do something different. Get out of your comfort zone. Because when we think like a temple thinking, like that, we just go and they'll come and they'll come to us and we'll work with them, that is shallow, flawed thinking. That is evangelistic thinking that is always centered on people who come to you. But you know what? God tells us we need to go to them. And when we think about that, that we're just going to deal with the people, the fish, okay, let's do it like this. How many of you all like the fish? How many of you all like the fish? Okay, all right. Now, Stephen, I know you like the fish, right? Have you ever had a time when a fish jumped in a boat for you? No, no, no. Have you ever that happened before? Jamie, it happened to you? What did you do? To it? You ate it. Okay, well, that's good. That's good. Uh, that's my boy. That's all. So, so yeah. But really, does that ever happen, does it? What do we need to do? We need to go out to them. We need to go and look for the fish. We need to go and cast the net. We need to go and share the food that they're going to bite on, right? We're, we're supposed to go out there and be fishers of men. We ought to go out and to be where the people are, to do what the people do, and share the love of Jesus Christ to it and hurt a lost and dying world. If we don't, Jesus calls, says it's like salt losing its saltiness. I got news for you. They're normally not going to ever jump in a boat. We got to go where the people are, as Jesus did. And this is the way we should act. This is how we are salt and light to the world. We're supposed to be like this. Look at what it says in verse 2. He says, My hand made all these things, and these all things came in a band. But this is what I look to. Who is humble and can try the spirit and trembles at my word. In other words, if we are based and grounded in him, 
when we have God's Word in our hearts, and we go out to seek out people who need Jesus, and we have a, a, an attitude of gratitude, and we live not like the world, but like the Lord wants us to live. And we're different than the world. When we do that and we live in humility, then you're happy when you're working with them. When you're out, whether you're working in Walmart, or you're working in an in office, or you're working in a school, no matter where you are, wherever you are, if God is, is using you in, in a humble way and, and you, you act like you really truly love Jesus, you will be salty to the world and you will have God centered conversations, God moments with people. And you begin to get bolder and bolder as you share and you pray about things that are going on in your life. Let me just tell you, God has put on Teresa in my heart to, to sell our house and to move to another house in Green Hills. We, we're, we're selling our house. We bought a house. We're closing on it this Friday. Um, Lord willing, we, you know, no issues come up, but it looks like we're going to be closing on Friday. And we, we're going to have, we're going to own two houses for a little while. Now, when I'm not rich, believe me. But it, it, it doesn't make me notice. I'll be out, okay? But, but God's got this. Amen? Why? Because we're going to be, we've been in the same house for seven years. We've, we've spoken to people. We've been able to talk to people. But now we're going to be in a place where we really, truly feel like we can be used to reach more people around us in Green Hills. Well, praise the Lord for that. It, does it make me uncomfortable? Yeah. But my hope is that we will be salty to people that are around us. That they will see us as being different and begin to look to the God that we love. We are humble and try to spirit and trumbles at his word. When you're humble, you then shine the light of humility. Then and as you humbly focus on him, you are shining the light of hum- humility. There's your blank. It changes your relationship with God, and it changes the way people look at you in your relationship with them. You care about other people. You care about their concerns. You care about their needs. You begin to ask them, how can I pray for you? You begin to, to focus on them and not on yourself. That's the thing that comes from the inside, that, that God, who is the maker of all the universe, who has a personal relationship with you, who loves you and loves people, causes you to also love people as God loves them. You see things with kingdom eyes. And you shine the light of Christ on everybody you contact with. We need to be salt and light to the world. When people hear about First Baptist Church of Mount Healthy, it should be a positive thing. Amen? And it is a positive thing. I talk to people all the time. They say, oh, yeah, you're the church on the corner, yeah? Oh, man, I heard good things about you. Well, come on. Come on. Come and worship with us. Come and enjoy God, what God is doing. Get a chance to really share the love of Jesus Christ. Do we compromise our stance and matter of truth? No way. But we always show the love of Jesus. We, we share the love of Jesus, share the truth of Jesus. So the average person see a love that emanates from us and a commitment to biblical truth that is uncompromising. And no matter what, we are not going to bend on that. We are going to hold to it. This includes the second part of it. Humility first to shine the light of humanity, uh, of humility. But second, we remove the darkness of hypocrisy. My granddaughter, Callie, loves this show called Sheriff Callie, C-A-L-L-I-E, I think is how it's spelled. Has anybody ever heard of that show? Sheriff Callie? Yeah, Miss Kristen, has that. anybody else know that? Yeah. It's a, it's a little kitty cat. And she's got this hat, and she's a sheriff in the Wild West. And Sheriff Kelly goes and she's a, she kind of keeps everything uh, nice and, and, and friendly and, and, and this, uh, this town that she's a, she's a sheriff of is called Nice and Friendly Corners. Isn't that nice? And friendly, isn't it? Yeah. Well, one day, one episode, she has this uh, deputy and his deputy is a uh, woodpecker and his name is Deputy Peck. Makes sense? And Deputy Peck was a little over exuberant when doing his new job. Kind of like some of you all know Bonnie Fife. Yeah, right? Right? And, uh, and Sheriff Callie went out of town to go help somebody deliver mail, and she put Deputy Peck in charge. And before you know it, Deputy Peck had jailed every single resident of nice and friendly town for little minor things. You didn't know the door open for so and so. That wasn't nice and friendly. Go in jail. After a while, 
everybody started getting jailed, and while it all happened, an escaped convict named Billy the Goat, Billy Goat the Kid, I'm serious, got out and started stealing people's stuff. Well, what was the lesson learned? Chef Cowley came back and took care of it and all that. The lesson learned is don't always major on the minor. Say that. And while Billy the Goat, oh, Billy Goat, while Deputy Peck was worried and being so legalistic about every little thing and legislating his morality and all these things and worrying about that, he was being hypocritical because he wasn't taking care of the real stuff, the big stuff. And oftentimes, church, we make minds out of morals. We major on the minors, and in so doing, we miss the good stuff, and we're known for being the mean people instead of being the people who love. Now, I'm not saying to compromise biblical truth, but I am saying let's be careful we don't get legalistic. That's one thing. Or we get so far from legalism to liberalism that we say everything is permissible and everything is okay. And we resemble the world so much that you can't tell the difference between the world and the church. You see what I'm saying? So now we do whatever the world does, it's okay for us to do. Well, ladies and gentlemen, not everything is profitable. Not everything will be glorifying to God. In fact, if you do some things that you shouldn't be doing, right? Kind of going back to what Lois says every year around, around New Year's, right? What do you say, Bert? Don't do what you should yeah, don't be doing what you should shouldn't be doing. Do what you need to do, or so whatever. You know, but yeah, you know, if we if we do if we go and we do whatever the world does, that could be a stumbling block to people. Amen. That's why if you are living with someone, you shouldn't be living with someone. If you're going out and getting drunk and calling yourself a Christian, you shouldn't be doing that. That's a stumbling block to other people. So we've got to be careful that we don't see hypocrisy in our world. And we remember the darkness of hypocrisy, and we love for Christ, and we shine out of humanity, and we love and humble in godly life. Just like Moses did eventually, just like Peter did eventually, who became humble men in Christ. Of course, we have the greatest example of humility, and that's Jesus, right? He never was hypocritical. The one we should be more and more like. So, we play a religious game. We walk like hypocrites. We're going to uh, harm the, the 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 gospel of Jesus Christ. Instead, we should be humble. God honors. Look what He says again: "To him who is humble and contrite of spirit, and he trembles at my word." That's who we are to be. Second, second word: delights. If we say the right things and we do the right things and we work through the right things, you know, reassess our heart, and I'm reassessing my heart all the time, make sure I'm walking the way I should be walking, not compared to anybody else. I don't compare myself to Brian or Harry or Ron or, or Bruce or Daryl or, or, or Anita. I don't compare myself to other people. I should be comparing myself to what God wants me to do. And as we do that and we come into a deeper intimacy with God, then we should together individually be sure that we are delighting in God. Delight. And in doing so, you have an intimacy in nothing else but God's presence. Look at verse 7. Look what he says here. I mean, sorry, verse 12. Here's an example of the intimacy that you have when you're spending time with the Lord. Look what he says. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I extend peace to her like the river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream, and you will be nursed, carried on a hip and fondled on the knees. This is an intimacy with God that we don't like to think about, but what he's trying to say is the same kind of imagery that Paul uses in First Thessalonians. And it's like a nursing mother who cares for her children. That's a beautiful thing, church. I know that, you know, you kind of get imagery here, but that's a beautiful thing. That's a that's a intimacy that a mother has for children, and so we should be with God. When we're hungry, that God fulfills that hunger, that God that God meets that need, and God continues to be close to us and brings us close to Him, so that we have the presence of God in our lives each and every day, each and every moment, each and every hour. What does it mean to have intimacy in God's presence? It's when the child of God spends so much time with the Father that He has nothing but the loving contentment in His presence. 
We see that in Exodus 33, verse 9. When, when the people of Israel saw that when Moses, let me, let me read it. It came to pass that when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of cloud would come and descend and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. That the people saw Moses shine because of his presence with the Father. There would be reflected on his face. L- ladies and gentlemen, the presence of God, the intimacy with God should be a delight to you and reflected on your face to others. That you have a hunger for God so much that even the, the, the TV show that you are scheduled to watch doesn't distract you. Isn't that funny how we do that? Our society has come, and I do this too, that we even now DVR our TV shows because we don't want to miss it. Right? When they got us, they got us when they, we know when your favorite TV show. Let me give you an example, okay? What, uh, somebody name a favorite TV show of theirs and, and, and when it is. What, what day, what night of the, the week it is. Somebody name that. What is it? Perry Mason. Okay. He's a real friend, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so when is that shown? When is 11.30 at night. Okay. All right. All right. And, and see, I ask, what night is that? What is it? Thank you. Thank you. You know, we know exactly what they got us, don't they? They got us. And if we're not going to be there, what do we do? We click on our remotes and we schedule and we do. It should, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, if we schedule time to watch TV and just sit there drawing while we're watching or drinking uh, a soda or a water and or eating a popcorn while we're watching them, and we're doing that, how much more should we schedule and have time with them, not just at that moment of the day, but each and every hour of the day? We should have delight that we have intimacy in God's presence that nothing ever should distract us, nothing comes first, no busyness, no wants, no desire should ever come between you and your desire with God. So that that way, that when you experience the tough times, you have the joys and you have the difficult times, that when you have the difficult times, you can experience, look at this next point, comfort at the hands of the Redeemer. Comfort in the hands of the Redeemer. Look at where he goes when he goes from verse 12 to verse 13. Look what he says. Start with verse 12 again. And you will be nursed, you will be carried on a hip and followed on the knees. Look what he says in 13. And as one who his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. And that you will see this. Look at this. That you and your heart will be glad, and your bones will flourish like the new grass, and the hand of the Lord will be known to his servants, and he will be made indignant, or he will be indignant towards, but he will be indignant towards his enemies. Talking about God. Last Tuesday, I had one of the hardest workouts. I, I try to work out every Tuesday and every Friday, okay, at, at this um, fitness place. And I work out every Tuesday there. And Tuesday was one of the hardest workouts I ever did. He had us do, and now Nick's probably going to laugh because Nick does a whole lot more than I do. He had us do 600 repetitions of exercises. And you're like, okay, what did you do? Push ups, sit ups. If you know what burpee is, burpees, all these stuff that is like, you know, no, all those 50 year old men should be done, right? And you're done, they say, and let me just tell you something. I mean, it works for my cranking bones, okay? You know what I'm saying? The next day, the day after, and I don't even a fire, I had so muscles. My bones were cranking, and I need a right one. What he's saying here is, he's saying, look at this. And when you hear this, and your creaking bones, not from physical exercise, but from weariness of the world, your creaking bones, look what he says here, your bones will flourish in him like no grass. You will be comforted, and you will be delighted, and God is rest for your weary bones. You take the light in God, and he will comfort you. He will strengthen you. You will walk like he says, right? Like you, like you know, you're going to have the wings of eagles. You will walk and not be weary. Amen? You will, you will, you will walk and you will not be weary. You will, you will walk, you will not be afraid. You will need mercy, you will receive mercy. When you need joy in the midst of your circumstances, God gives you joy. How? We're delighting in Him, focusing on Him, spending time with Him, just, just saying nothing of the God alone, living humbly and worshiping Him each and every day. Not just 
one hour or two hours, but even during the moments in between your work, you say, let me just stop and praise God for this. Eric's not here today, but he's one guy that I love about Eric. We will sit there and we'll have a conversation. And, you know, the, he probably did that with you in Ghana, brother, right? And Justice, great to have you back, man. Justice is back from Ghana. Um, and, he, you know, I'm sure that he did this in Ghana, but we would talk and all of a sudden Eric would say, Eric Norman would say, oh, let's stop and pray for that. Did y'all ever experience that? That's Eric Norman right there. We would stop and pray because we have a, he has a constant connection with the Lord. You're not focused on yourself. You're focused on God. You're focused on His kingdom. And his people, his, his work. And your delight in God becomes a delight to others as they react to your relationship with God. There's two words so far to live from. To get rid of that crying baby that's inside of you and focus instead of God. The first word was humility. The second word is delight. Here comes the third word, and, word, and that's expectancy. Expectancy. Do you live every day like you are expecting what we see in verse 15? Look what he says here. Verse 15. Behold, the Lord will come in fire in his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Go down to verse 20. And they shall bring all the brethren from all the nations as a green offering to the Lord on horses, chariots, litters, mules, and camels to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. Just as the sons of Israel bring the green offering and a green vessel to the house of the Lord, I will put, take some of them for priests and for Levites. And just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, will endure before me, so your offspring and your name will endure. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the definition of expectancy. We are together, first blank, waiting for Christ's return. We're just waiting for Jesus to come again. Amen? Amen? When Teresa was pregnant with Marky, our, our daughter, Marky was two weeks late. Now, Frank was five weeks early. So, so that's quite a swing to go to her being late with Marky. Marky just didn't want to come out, I guess, you know? And, and so we tried, you know, we try all these little things that we need to do. You know, you know what I'm saying? Y'all try different things when a woman is late. Do we, we try different things, and one of them was uh, take her to a bumpy road. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And so I took, I took my wife to a bumpy road, and we got in our, um, I think it was a Dodge Omni, I think, at, at the time. And um, we got in a Dodge Omni, and I took her, I knew a bumpy road. I knew the bumpiest road in Daytona Beach area. And, and we got on there, it was like, <laughs> not a thing. Didn't happen. Not a thing happened. We just waited. We couldn't wait until this baby would come. This is what we're doing right now. We're still at God's overdue, but God's always on time, amen? We are waiting. This is what we're experiencing. For God, for Christ to come, and all the creations experience both pains, earthquakes, and, and by the way, if you want to know more about it, a little plug, come Wednesday night, because Wednesday night we're going to continue on Matthew 24 talking about that. But we know things are going to get worse. The callousness, we talked about Wednesday night, rebellion, persecution, tribulation, pestilence, uh, famine, earthquakes. Well, uh, wars, rumors of wars. We, we know those things are happening now, but it's going to get even worse. The Great Tribulation. We hear about 21 brothers of Christ in Egypt who are beheaded by evil, evil ISIS. They are, I'm sorry, they are evil groups. You say, well, we shouldn't be talking about people like that. Well, you can be politically correct all you want. They are evil. By, by beheading Christians because of Christians. Now they're kidnapped uh, 120, 90, whatever the number is, Christians in Assyria. And they can try them to do the same thing. That's evil. We're going to see more and more of that. We're going to see people jailed just for believing in Christ. We see people being jailed now and put, uh, um, executed in different countries throughout the world. We're seeing people jailed in China and Yemen, elsewhere. It's going to get worse and worse as evil raises its ugly head. But suddenly, and, 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 and uh, when we least expect it and we hope for it to happen, God's going to say, no more. He's going to say, no more. And Christ then will appear in verse 15, we see here, that he will come and fire in his chairs like the whirlwind to begin judgment. While we wait, 
We come, we grow, we serve, we share. While we wait, we're humble in Christ. While we wait, we delight in God. While we wait, we seek to find His presence and advance the kingdom to ask God to bring one more into the kingdom. And we share, and we, we baptize, and we worship, and we unify, and we magnify, and we walk in humility, and we join in intimacy with God, and we wait in expectancy because it's not a matter of Christ is coming to matter of when. And so when we do that, we begin to change our thinking from the shallow baby crying on the inside because he doesn't get his way and start to think instead about living for and with a kingdom purpose. You remove the temptation to think about yourself all the time and self-preservation and instead think about what God can do through you. Let me encourage you and, and push you and press you even harder to think about your life. What is God saying to you about how you can join Him in the kingdom to do His will in your life? If God, has God put you in a work situation where you could be self and light to your co-workers? Look, we got a perfect opportunity here. Right? To build a very non-threatening way to bring people here to the doors of this church and the pews of this church. And you bring them here, okay, next week we need to have our tickets out, right? But, but bring them here to watch the Passion Play. It's an amazing you come. It's an amazing Passion Play. Changes. But it's great on the, on the announcement, right? Big, big changes. Bring them. Listen, don't shy away from telling them about the truth of Jesus Christ in your life. Maybe you need to examine your own heart. See your intimacy with God. See what God can do to change it. Maybe you need to look in your own heart and make big adjustments in your life to align with God's calling. Start living day to day for Jesus Christ. Start living and thinking about the kingdom work in your life and others to come to Him. Now today, I know that there are many here that may know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but maybe you're wondering if you die today, if you go to heaven. Well, you know that if you believe that you've got to know that you're a sinner and that only God can save you from your sins by trusting in Jesus Christ and His death on the cross who took the punishment for your sins, the Bible says that's the only way that you can be saved. Maybe you need to trust in Christ for your salvation and begin a new life in Him. Maybe you need to recommit your life. Maybe you haven't been living day to day. You don't have a quiet time with God. When you hear the pastor talk or somebody else talking about your quiet time, you kind of cringe because you, you don't really have that time. Spend that time with them. Maybe you need to recommit to that. Maybe you need to be a member here at this church or to be baptized or to pray for someone or some need. Maybe there's something going on in your life and you need to make that solidify that. Remember, there's three key words. Remove that crying child inside, that little brat that's inside of you, that was inside of me. And start walking in humility. Start, start walking to humbly follow Him. Start, start thinking about how you can, 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 can listen and, and follow Him. Start trembling and, and taking delight in Him and, and focusing on spending time with Him. And, and then also, not beside, besides humility and, and delight, live in expectancy of the day of Christ. Father, I pray that we will live for Him.